Um, so the purpose of the webinar today um, is to share our hands-on experience um, to researchers that have knowledge and um, experience in genome editing. So webinar is, the today's webinar will give you an overview of a CRISPR-Cas9 editing in blood lineage cells, and it will also will give you some guided guidelines and tips to enhance your CRISPR gene editing process. So first I will give you a brief uh, introduction about uh, applied stem cell and uh, what do we do. So uh, applied stem cell mainly focus on genome uh, engineering service. So we have, uh, we provide in cell line and animal models. And the models we uh, provide are mainly as mouse and rats. For cell lines, they include the cancer cells, uh, immune cells, and stem cells, or any other uh, cell line that customer requests. Um, so today's topic, we're mainly focusing on gene editing in immune cells. Um, so um, besides that, um, uh, we are also developing our preparatory um, genome engineering um, technology and some uh, stem cell technology. Uh, we also have internal R&D for clinical applications. So this is the outline of uh, today's talk. Uh, first, we will focus on um, the CRISPR efficiency. Uh, we test the, uh, the couple of RNAs among all th uh, three um, um, majorly used uh, blood-derived cell lines, and we find out that uh, the gut activity is a varies among the cells. And then we, our solution is to have a dedicated cast expression cell lines for um, gut line validations. The second part of the talk, we give you some case studies uh, including knockouts, large DNA fragment knock-ins, and power mutations. And third part, so we will give you some guidelines and tips to enhance the CRISPR editing um, in terms of the design of a guideline A, donor, and caseline. So let's get started. So um, let's make sure everybody on the same page, I give a very brief um, CRISPR um, introductions. So CRISPR, um, there's two major components in CRISPR. One is a Cas9 and one is a guideline A. So, Cas9 is an endonucleus uh, that cuts within the polynucleotide chain. Um, so you can imagine that um, so CRISPR is like a, a cruise missile. So Cas9 is like explosive, and a guide on a um, is the computer program that tell um, Cas9 where to target to. So with a Cas9 and a guide on a, um, you are able to target specific sequence in the genome and create a double strand break. So once you create a double strand break, a cell would on, uh, it goes into uh, two um, major uh, DNA repairing pathway. And one is non homologous end joint, and one is the, the homosteroid repair. So with the uh, NHEJ, um, this is the error prone uh, repair pathway. So it would randomly generate a deletion and insertion. So this pathway is very useful to generate knockouts. Uh, with the insertion or deletion, you will have this friendship, and then your gene will not express anymore. So for HDR, you would use uh, the double strand break, or we we'll use uh, a DNA template. So with a small uh, donor DNA template or with a, a plasmid donor, you are able to generate upon mutations or a larger pieces like a GFP knockout. So the first, um, what we're going to talk about, um, so in some of the project that uh, we used one guy um, in this cell line that was very successful, and that once we used this guy you know, in the other cell lines, it turns out that it was not uh, as efficient as before. And we find out a couple of cases like this. We find out that uh, so we decided to go on inside and do a thorough study to compare the sky line among the three major cell lines. So the three cell lines that we were using is KFLAX62, Jerket, and TF1 cells. Uh, these three cell lines are um, the mostly frequently um, asked and requests from the customers. So. Um, so the Galang A uh, plasma put in has a U6 and Galang A cassette, and it also has a Cas9 GFP under a CBH promoter. So this um, this plasma is around the 8 to 9 KB. So uh, the transfection is efficiency a little bit lower um, than the GFP plasma is about like 4 or 5 KB. So um, we first we have to make sure the GFP um, of, uh, we measure the GFP intensity to make sure that if uh, transfection efficiency is achieved similarly. Um, so if you deduct the dead cells. Um, the live cells of GLP possibly is about 65 percent uh, in jacket and K5 C2 cells, and TF1 is 70 percent. So they have a similar um, efficiency, and the, the picture was taken using the same exposure time. So we make sure that GLP expression is similar as well. So um, we test total eight, uh, which is pick up the four um, result here to to demonstrate um, the differences. 
So the first, we test out um, this garlic amount of three cell line. In the blue square, you see um, these two lines, um, they have um, similar um, gala activities, and but they are lower in the TF1 cells, um, same as this one. So, um, but uh, in this, in this, in this gala, you see the highest gala activity in the KFIC2, very lower uh, in the jerkhead and TF1 cells. And in these cases, um, you find that it's, oh, this gala is inactive in jerkhead cells, and the lower in the TF1 cells. So we summarize this data um, in, uh, in the figure like this. So um, in most of the cases, um, you see that the gala has similar activities um, uh, between the jerkhead and KFOX CD2, and the TF1 is generally have lower, so like in the G1, G3, G4, and so on. In some guidelines, they are lower in the jerkhead and TF1, and some guidelines do not um, have the activities um, in jerkhead cells. So um, the message we want to deliver here is that um, among these three cell level tests, we found the KFOX CD2 give you the highest guideline activities. So let's say you have one guideline working one cell line, it works pretty well and you want to use, continue to use that guideline into other cell lines. So that makes sure that this guideline activity is sort of validated in the cell line, uh, in the next cell line you want to work on. So um, if you, um, you're testing this guideline in just one, um, um, one cell line, such as K5CD2, uh, you may overestimate the activities in other cell lines. So another example we can give it to you um, is a guideline called um, G9A, number nine. Uh, we found this very positive in K5C2 cells, and it turns out in jerky cells, uh, it's only 1%. So we, we've been using this guideline quite a while, and we find out for some reason we just couldn't get the clone we want. And we go back and look at the uh, efficiency, find out it turns out really low in jerky cells. And we find that another three cell lines, that you also, uh, I'm sorry, another three guideline lines around this region, they also show you a very low activity as well. And this is a positive control, make sure the experiment was done correctly. So um, with this, um, so we decided to go on to have a, a jerk and cell step with this Cas9 expression line so that we can make sure that the guideline um, uh, activity um, is, uh, is the, uh, the correctly measured um, in the same cell line. So what we're using is we use the synthetic guideline oligos. Um, the synthetic guide, so first you compare these two lens. So we, we put the synthetic guideline into the jerk and uh, C9M cell and the wire tile cells. In wire tile cells, you don't see any activities. And here is a pretty uh, decent activities. So you say, so um, the reason I indicate that the cell lines uh, show the integrated Cas9 activities. So the CRISPR adding can be achieved simply just introduces the synthetic guideline. So another message we want to deliver is that if you use a uh, transcript the guy along with the Cas9 plasmid, in this case we have two different Cas9 plasmid, V1 and V2, they both don't give you um, uh, any activities. So we found this at the synchronization of the Cas9 DNA with the synthetic guideline oligos. So um, just keep in mind that if you want to use the synthetic guideline oligo, uh, make sure either go with the Cas9 protein or go with the cells that with the Cas9 expression. So um, now we're going to um, give you some case study um, of our um, blood cells um, gene editing services. We increase the knockouts, the large DNA piece knocking, and point patients. So first we go through the knockouts. So um, when a project come in, uh, before coming, we have project evaluations. Um, first, we have to make sure your cell line have a correct doubling time, what's the transfection efficiency, and the collagenicity. Uh, we suggest that all the researchers uh, make sure your cell line, uh, check these uh, characteristics um, of your cell lines. Your doubling time will significantly affect your um, single cell colony process if you want a pure clone. And your transfection efficiency, of course, um, depends. If you want to transfect Cas9 plasma in there, if you have a low transfection efficiency, you are not able to get a good um, editing efficiency. Uh, that's post clonogenicity. So you have to make sure your cells grow from single cells so that you're able to get a pure clone. So um, once the project come in, um, we will design a gallon A and we will validate a gallon A. This took about uh, three to five weeks. And then we will prepare all the materials and we will um, transfer these materials into the cells. It takes about one to two weeks. And then we will clone the cells. It took about one month. Um, depends on your cells. So for cells that are doubling out within 24 hours, um, single cell cloning step took about, about three weeks. Um, if your cells are uh, the doubling time is between 24 to 48 hours, it, takes, it may take four to five weeks. And we have one cell line, so the doubling time is once a, seven day, uh, once a week. So that took us uh, the five. Um, about like uh, three to four months to get. 
So in the last step, the genotyping served about one to two weeks. The total uh, timeline for NACA project, it took about um, two to three months. And another thing I want to mention about, um, so during the project evaluation, we need to check the gene of interest. Um, you have to know that which splicing form you want to knock out. Um, if there's spe specific splicing form you knock out, uh, make sure the axon you're targeting is a bit unique. Um, so, uh, so sometimes it can be very complicated um, in this case. But feel free to consult us for suggestions. Um, another part is the guide availabilities. For knockout project, we wouldn't worry too much because you have very high uh, flexibility um, uh, to a lot of space you can generate knockouts. And this part I want to mention is uh, the gene copy number. Um, so a lot of cell lines, they are uh, unemployed. So you need to make sure that um, if your cell lines only have two or three copies or four copies, it probably um, is easy to do. But if you have more than five or six copies, uh, even knockouts, uh, sometimes can be challenging. And the second round, the third round of targeting may be necessary. So um, I'll give you um, a real example. So um, we have a project that researchers want to knock out uh, these genes that we just fly back on. So um, when we design the knockout, um, the guy that we picked that we will make sure that we create uh, the out of frame mutations, and then we will avoid the truncated mutation site um, by um, selecting the guideline location. Um, when we say um, correctly selecting guide location, it means that we usually keep the ATG there. Um, so that uh, if you remove the ATG, the cell, uh, for some reason, they'll find another ATG in, under the promoter, and then there's a chance you get truncated proteins. So um, if there are some multiple forms, um, we usually aim for the early common axon, coding axons. Um, so uh, however, if there's a specific um, axon specific isoform you would like to keep, and however they are overlapping uh, with their coding axon. We have some situation like that. Um, the design will be more complicated, um, but we do have a solution for that. And then the next part is we validate the guy um, around uh, uh, the, in, in the axon one. So we validate the three guidelines. Um, it turns out the G2 has the highest activity, so we decide to go for this one. So um, once you transfer your uh, uh, guideline plasma in there, um, before you do the single cell cloning, uh, we have a one critical step we recommend everybody do uh, to do is uh, the pre genotyping. So you will make sure that your um, uh, this is actually the genome um, your guideline plasma works in your cell line. So in this case, it's a heterogeneous population. So you'll see a lot of double pickings right after the guideline cuts. Um, so uh, when we see this double picking, then we are confident that uh, there are some uh, CRISPR editing events are going on here. Then, then we are confident to move on to single cell cloning. For single cell cloning, we usually put the 0.5 cells to one cells in one way of 96 role play. So for checker cells, um, play with this density, we give you about five to 10, 10 clones per 96 world plate. So um, if you would like to pick 100 clones per total, you probably need to play um, 10 plates of 96 world plates. And then, um, so during the single cell cloning, uh, some clones will grow fast, some clones grow slow. So um, we pick up the first uh, 15 fast growing clones, and we find the three heterozygous, five homozygous, and five mixed clones, which means that they are, they are not from single cells, and some clones are knockout, some clones are white type, and the two clones are white type. So totally like 13 out of 15 um, efficiencies uh, uh, is like that for, for knockouts. So this is uh, this is our final deliverable. Uh, this is one T insertion uh, right at the cutting site, and these were PIM sequences. So um, next is the large DNA fragment knocking. So the difference is the timeline difference is basically is the donor construction um, because if you're you need a DNA um, donor and then uh, you're, you have additional drug selection step about one week. So total it would be a four to six month uh, for a large pieces DNA knock-in. And one thing you need to know about your cell line is make sure your cell line do not have um, a selection marker that you will be using in a donor plasma. Okay, so in this case, um, we have a project that a customer, the researcher want to express a specific isoform under the endogenous promoter in the meanwhile and, and to prevent the expression with other isoforms. So, um, so our, our strategy is to keep um, 
the induction promoter and the induction is the 5 prime UTR. So we designed a guideline around the ATG um, in the, the star core. So um, our donut design um, basically is have um, a 1 kb um, homology arm, 5 and 3, and within these um, arms we have a gene of interest and then we give a transcription terminator, poly A over here. And after that, we have a pyramidal solution marker in our reversed um, directions. So um, this is the your targeted um, genome uh, will be look like. Um, so um, here you can see you have the genome interest right after the ADG, induction the ADG, and the UTR as transcription um, terminator, and if you're pyramizing over here. So we perform uh, drug selection for 10 to 14 days to ensure the donor fragment is integrated into the genome. So you have to make sure that selection is long enough to exclude the possibility of the, um, of the chance in um, pyramizing expression on the plasma. So usually 10 to 14 days is no. So then we proceed for single cell cloning and then you pick up um, the clones for genotyping. So for genotyping for this large piece of knocking, um, you have to make sure that you have designed your PCR primer correctly. So first, uh, for, so the, the junction PCR, uh, you have to make sure that your one-side primer is in the gene of, uh, the, gene of the, uh, the gene you insert and the one side of primer uh, should be the outside of the arms. So if you have the one primer with your arms, it could be the random insertion of the whole donor plasma. So, um, and we have the same design for the three prime junction. So we primarily screened all the clones with the five junctions and three junctions. So um, these clones, they are both positive and five junction and three junction. So the clones of, and the some clones only have one side, uh, we consider it as an active. So pick up the, this, the potential, these clones with both five junction and three prime junction and we consider them as a potential positive. Um, we call them potential because we haven't sequenced yet. Um, another reason is that um, the purpose is to get a homozygous clone. So when you get the, this sequence that you don't know if it's homozygous or not. So we have to do another round of screening, uh, which is uh, we call homozygous PCR. So we basically design a primer within the arms. If it's a wild type, these pieces will be very short. Uh, if it's correct, there's something lacking over here, that you're not going to see a band if your PCR um, extension time is low. Yeah. So we pick up these potential clones and we do the homozygous PCR check. Um, we see the majority of the clones that have a wild type copy, a wild type allele. So and there's one clone that um, we find out there's no, uh, no bands. And we later on the sequence is verified uh, is the correct uh, homozygous clones. Yeah. So this is an overview that how you um, screen for uh, large pieces of DNA. So uh, the next we'll talk about is the point mutation. So the point mutations on uh, the time time is totally is about three to five months. Um, so point mutations rarely have lower efficiency um, than the large piece of knocking and knockout. So sometimes the second round of targeting may be needed. So um, but the three to five month is about is the time time you get. So uh, for this. Um, this is one project that is, is done in TF1 cells. Um, we have a mutation in the axon 4. So there were only two guidelines available. This is so called the guideline number one and number two. Number one look at the upstream of the mutation site, and number two is look at the on top of the mutation site. So here um, I'd like to briefly um, give an introduction that um, um, when do you add uh, solid mutations? Uh, or it's or you call it a SNP mutations. So let's say this is just an example, not, not this case. Let's say you have to find a guideline G5. Let's say this is the only one you get. Um, so this is a mutation you want to make good I mean the Q to A changes. So um, so you design a donor with this uh, I'm gonna uh, nucleotide changes, but uh, you can mind that um, your repair allele um, we have the this piece of sequence intact. Uh, for the guy to, to retargeting. So you have to change something over here to make sure the guy will not target over here. And another example is, so let's say the G5, you would like, like to change this tyrosine into alanine. So although this mutation is on top of the, your guy is on top of the mutation, however, it's located at the very end of the guy So it has been um, reported that just 15 base pair um, 
of the guideline is sufficient to um, to create a double strand break using CRISPR-Cas9. So if you have mutation over here, you still leave this core 15 base pair intact. So it is likely this is G5, we're going to target this sequence again and give you unwanted um, indels. So um, sometimes silent mutations are required. So um, what we would do is that you can put silent mutation either in a PAM sequence or you, put, you can put the silent mutation in a core of 15 base pair. The closer to the PAM, the better. Using um, actually uh, requires some silent mutations. So after we transfect the guideline plasmid and we do the preliminary genotyping, uh, this is a this is a pool um, of the electroporation cells, the cells after extrapolation. So you can see a lot of double peaks over here. And uh, within these double peaks, we are able to see the silent mutations and the mutation we want to. So we are very confident about this um, this gene targeting, and we proceed to to the single cell clone. So um, um, in our donor design, um, the corrected uh, modified allele, we have a unique research enzyme site, uh, which we can uh, use for genotyping. So um, if you um, if you are able to put some um, solid mutations, or you get to choose that what nucleotide to change, we suggest you um, put a, create a unique uh, research enzyme site. Uh, it will be easier for you um, to do the genotyping later. Um, about like um, 122 clones, um, there will be eight of them that show the positive in the, in the restriction digestion analysis. So among these clones, you get about three of them that show the correct homozygous mutations, two of them about have one correct mutation and one allele Y type, and three of them show the one correct allele, the other allele is just indels. So um, for this purpose, we get about, we only have the, about 1.5% of um, correct um, efficiency to get the homozygous mutations. Um, so I know you may have heard of a lot of uh, read some literature that give you um, uh, HDR rate um, over 30% or 50%. Um, so the number we see in here um, is the, the real life number. So the number you saw this paper, they either have the gun and cut the very exactly where the modification they want, and the modification usually very small, usually one to two base pair, and they create a, a of restriction and the sign. So when they screen the clone, they just use the restriction and the sign. If it can cut it, they consider positive. So among this positive clone, they maybe have a lot of, of the false positive. Because what we are doing here is that we sequence every clone, make sure that all the clones have exactly homozygous mutation. So um, the, 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 in the real project, you will, you will be more stringent um, in, the, in the result. So if you get the efficiency around 1% to 5%, um, that's the real number you will get, yeah. and don't be surprised. So in this, uh, we want to give you some guidelines and tips um, so to use the CRISPR-Cas9 to generate your desired mutation without the guideline abilities. And second one, we'll talk, give you um, some tips to enhance your screening process. The last one, um, we will show you that uh, the approach is to add it to the cell line that's sensitive to the end possible. So, um, so first, we will show you um, the strategy. Um, if you don't have a guideline um, around this region, so what would you do? So let's say there's a design mutation in these axons. You don't have a good RNA, or, you, or there's no guideline at all. So what would you do? So what we do is that we pick some some um, the regions that are far from uh, a little bit of far from the design mutation site, and we give it a selection marker donor, a, a donor plus with a selection marker. So first, uh, the site you find, it should be a, a, a digestive region that do not jeopardize the gene expression. Uh, it can be the entrums, or it can be the region, the aptitude to three-point UTR. Uh, if you already know your three-point UTR, uh, it's not, um, do not affect your regulation, gene regulation, you are okay to put your, um, you're okay to target your three-point UTR as well. And they try to, um, the tips try to avoid the region that's over 300 base pair. Uh, in that case, um, you will get a, a much, much lower uh, efficiency. So the um, so idea is that to pick a guide only that has a, f a little bit far from your desired mutation. So you, then you have a you reduce the targeting efficiency. But later on, it can be compensated by introducing a selection marker, a donor plasma with a selection marker concept. So uh, this is a real project that we have here in Axon 18. 
So uh, this is desired mutation here. We test all three guideline, all of them active in the cell lines. So we decided to use a, a donor plasmid. So the donor plasm has one KB on, on both sides. And uh, here, and we have the mutations, desired mutation. After desired mutation, we have the 3 prime UTR and the rest of the gene over here. And after that, we have the, uh, the selection marker in the reverse the direction. So um, this is some um, some notes to know um, um, something to know that uh, the advantages and disadvantages using a donor plasma with a selection marker. But first, you have um, a very high um, guideline flexibilities by using a, a, a donor plasma for let's say uh, point mutation changes. And uh, if so, this approach you can avoid the silent mutation at your target sites if we really, really don't like silent mutations. And we have a higher chance to generate the heterozygous models because first I talked a little bit far, um, a little bit far from your target site, and also you, if you do the uh, pyromycin selection, only one copy of not one allele knocking of uh, pyromycin is sufficient to give um, uh, uh, to give you the clone. So you have a higher chance to get a heterozygous model. Uh, also, we know that this process requires cloning, uh, which need can be done. Um, about one month, yeah. And uh, another downside could be uh, you need additional step to remove the selection marker cousin if you really don't want it. So um, let's like move to the second part. I'll give you some tips how to enhance your screening process. So um, this is our, um, our real data. One of our project we want to create a 50 individual mutations in um, in these 50 cell lines. So um, these are the mutation changes. Uh, for example, this one the insertion. Uh, of the GGT, and uh, this one just single base pair changes, this two base pair changes. And this column tells you the distance between the mutations and, the, and the, where the guideline cuts. This is the clones we screen, and this is the final um, deliverable um, for homozygous clone. So the message we want to tell is that um, the, shorter, um, the shorter distance between your mutation and the cut, the higher chance that you get a, a correct um, homozygous clone. So in this case, um, if this is a five base pair away, we just screen a hundred clones and four of them are positive. So if your if your mutation side is this is a nine base pair away uh, from the cut side, just screen three hundreds, you give it zero. Um, in this case, um, seven base pair away with three hundred, just give you zero. And among this um, among this uh, two among these two mutations, we actually can see a lot of correct mutation. But then you always count with the unwanted mutations, maybe because um, because the distance between the guideline and the the, the cut size is too far, um, and for this project we cannot apply the sign of mutations. So majority clones with the correct mutations come as unwanted indels um, because of a no sign mutation um, is allowed here. So um, so sometimes the sign mutation is just not a bad thing. It's more like protection um, for your the, the gene you want to uh, insert. And also, 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 it can enhance the efficiency to get a homozygous clone. So another point I want to uh, say is that if you have um, more than two base pair changes in here, you insert a three base pair, uh, you do the two base pair changes, uh, you are easier. Um, if you do these changes, are uh, much easier than just doing the one base pair changes, um, mainly because the chance of the retargeting. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of positive clones, you can see the mutation there. But there's an unwanted change um, where the guideline cuts. So um, the second things I will mention about the donor design. Uh, there was a very interesting paper published uh, by um, Dr. Jacob Cohn at uh, UC Berkeley uh, that talks about um, enhancing the HDR by using this asymmetric donor DNA. So um, uh, so we actually test their ideas um, by uh, comparing the conventional donor, which is 80 base pair arms. So this is where a guideline cuts. You have some silent mutation over here, and this is where the mutation you want to make. Um, so we create a, a conventional donor, which is the, uh, the 80 base pair arm, and we have a symmetric donor, 120 base pair, according to the paper. So we compare um, um, the, these two donors side by side. So first, we transfer the guideline plasmid either with the conventional donor or with the symmetric donor. And they both give you um, similar uh, CRISPR additive efficiency. And then 
we pick up a 96 clone, um, and we find that if you use the convention donor, uh, to zero out of 96, we found um, is a mutation. If we use the assembly donor, uh, so it's four out of 150, uh, we found a very correct, um, correct mutations. So um, I know this is just one-time study, but uh, we do find that this design um, indeed help uh, you to get the, the homozygous call and, uh, and to get the mutation you want to answer. And this is the, the genotype, this is the Y-type, and this is the homozygous we found. And this is the heterozygous um, the genotype. So another tip that we can give you to you is that um, try to enrich the, the cell with high Cas9 expression. So what we're doing right now is that um, instead of just using the Cas9 guide on a Cas9 plasmid, we also apply a different a Cas9 ex expression plasmid with a pyramycin. So um, so this additional plasmid uh, uh, can give you as it give you a chance of the higher Cas9 expression if you select the cells uh, with a pyromycin. So um, with the no pyromycin selection, this is the indels and the double picking you get um, three days after electrorations. So if you do the pyromycin chancing selection for two days and then you collect the cell um, and you do the Sanger sequence, you can see the much higher on the indels and much more on crispr activating event uh, compared to the one with the pyromycin selections. So um, this is a summary of the tip we would like to give you. Uh, first, of the, first, you need to have a proper DNA design. Um, avoid those truncate mutations um, and try to add the sign mutations um, if it is necessary. And we found a symmetric donor design I can enhance the HDR. And also uh, be my, uh, be my that uh, the re orientation of the single strand can also be critical. Um, this information can be found in the paper I just mentioned. And we also to find that increasing Cas9 expression and enriching the high Cas9 expression cells can significantly enhance the urine editing efficiency. So um, then we'll talk about um, our approaches to, um, to edit the cells that are sensitive to the DNA plasma. So first cell I will talk about is the NK cells. Um, we tried the several conditions that we find out um, um, by using electroration, you are able to get a very high transfection efficiency. Uh, turns out that these cells are die uh, immediately after DNA transfection. Um, you can see this is the morphology, uh, the day two after electroborations. And we will not be able to find any um, the guideline um, activities. So, our, so um, we tried to dip, tweak the condition a lot, try to lower the voltage, um, change all kinds of parameters, we either couldn't get indels or either also died. Um, so we decided to go for um, the Cas9 protein and synthetic RNA. So the Cas9 RNP uh, uh, is the, the RNA um, binding protein. Uh, we, so we used to synthesize the guide RNA and incubate the protein. So we test uh, several um, uh, other conditions uh, that tried a different uh, dosage um, of the guide RNA and the protein, and finally we are able to uh, modify these cell lines. You can see that if we compare to the DNA plasma and the RNP, so uh, with the RNP, the cells um, look uh, much better um, than the, the cells that uh, transfect the DNA plasma, which means that the RNA and protein there have much lower toxicity and then the DNA plasma for these NK cells. And here, um, this is the, and we found the cell can be successfully unedited, um, it's just 24%. So another cell line we talk about is the B cells. Um, it's the lymphoplastic acidic cells. And these cells is okay, can be transfect with a relatively high efficiency. However, the problem is that the cells gradually died after five days. Um, so um, if you collect cells two days after using DNA plasmid, a guide, guide on a DNA plasmid, you're able to see some indels here. But we have um, issue to, to, to grow the cells. The cells just simply stop um, growing by using DNA plus. And then if you use the Cas9 RNP, you can see the cell function is much, much better than using DNA plus, and you are able to achieve a higher transfection efficiency. Okay, so of the summary of today's talk is that um, we found the CRISPR-Cas9 efficiency can vary from cell to cells. Um, so if you want to apply a one guy um, from one cell line to another uh, to make sure um, you were um, this is the potential problem you will encounter. 
Um, the second is that we found the cas like RNA that does not functionally synchronize with synthetic RNA. We want to use the synthetic RNA to make sure that you either go with the cas protein or goes with the cell lines that has, uh, has, uh, has endogenous cas expression. And uh, to enhance your um, cas token efficiency, uh, please consider the following uh, facts. First, apply the side limitations if you have to. Um, the second thing is that have a proper single strand donor design. Uh, and we found that this asymmetric homology arms um, does help. And the third thing is that they enrich the cells with high cas expression. It can be done either by um, selection marker using pyramizing, or it can be done the GFP. So not just sort for the GFP positive cell, just so that the, the cells with higher um, GFP positive uh, signals. The third thing is the cas RMP is a good alternative for the cells that are sensitive to DNA transfections. So with that, um, I hope you find this webinar informative. And if you have any questions, please send uh, your question to this following email. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tai. Now we will take some questions. The first question is, what is the efficiency for large fragment knock-in in these cell lines? And can you do large fragment knock-in without a selection marker? Um, so for, it's, the knock-in efficiency definitely um, differs uh, from cell line to cell lines. Uh, for the cell line, for suspension cell line, we, we can be achieved the 20 to 60 percent. Uh, it depends on the cell lines. And among this 20 to 6 percent, um, the chance you get the homozygous would be up 10 to 30 percent. Yeah. So, um, so, but in the IP cells, in our hands, you can easily achieve over 50 percent knocking. And among this 50 percent knocking, the 50 percent of them are, can be homozygous. So this is really um, depends on the cell that you're using. So um, if you, to the second question, if you want to use a, a donor plasma without a selection marker, uh, this, the, the efficiency number definitely drops a lot. Um, so um, here, uh, we don't make much to do that if you work in the cell lines. Next question. Will using Cas9 RNP reduce the timeline for projects by how much? Um, so you, you use a RNP, basically, um, you save the time for cloning. Um, and we also find it's not time-wise, maybe you save you one to two weeks. Um, but uh, we found that the Cas9 RNP actually is more efficient, efficient than using a DNA plasmid. Um, also, uh, it is very useful for the cells that sensitive that are sensitive to the DNA just uh, DNA plasmid. Um, however, DNA plasmid do have some advantages. For example, if you want um, some enrichment, so you can co-express the, uh, the plasmid with the GFP or pyramizing. Um, that is something that is not uh, replaceable by using. Um, Yes, RMP. Next question. Is it possible for you to isolate cells from patient blood samples and do gene editing in them? So I, I assume this is uh, as a primary cells. So if we want to work on primary cells, um, a couple of things you need to consider is that whether your guideline will work in these cells and how efficient your guideline is. So if you want to work on these primary cells, we suggest to use a couple rounds of uh, the cells so that we can find the best conditions. Um, uh, but uh, with our experience, uh, we are confident that we are able to modify these cells. And to, to, uh, for genotyping, uh, to make sure that the knocking efficiency uh, it can be done by using next generation sequencing. Next question. Have you tried have you tried using Cas9 RNP in JERCAT and TF1? How does it compare to Cas9 DNA and Cas9 expressing cell lines? Um, so I would say that Cas9 RNP um, have the either the higher uh, efficiency or equal efficiency to the, the cell line with the Cas9 expression. And both of them will have higher expression than the Cas9 plasma. Yep. Next question. Can you compare the efficiencies of an in vitro transcripted gRNA and the synthetic gRNA? Um, so we 
we do use both um, in vitro transcribe and uh, the, the synthetic galangay. And both works. Uh, synthetic uh, in vitro transcribe give you much higher concentrations um, after uh, preparation, but we find that that the synthetic guideline actually give you a, a higher or even either an equal um, activity than using the, the IVT and the guidelines. Um, and the, the synthetic guideline is much easier um, to prepare. Uh, basically, just the order is just like a primer. Uh, for the individual transcribed, um, you have to do a, you have to do that, a, a transcription uh, to prepare the template and do a PCR and harvest and the purification. That takes a lot of longer time. Thank you all. That's all the questions we have time for now, but uh, we will be happy to answer additional questions individually via email. Please send your questions to info at and we will answer them for you.